So without further ado, I'd like to announce then our first talk on clusters. On star cluster formation and feedback, the, this team, the talk will be delivered by uh, Matthew Bate. Okay, this is working, that's good. <laughs> um, so I was looking at the uh, short title in the program booklet and it said star clusters and feedback and so I suddenly got confused about what I'm supposed to be talking about. So just to, to clear up the confusion, I'm not going to be talking about star clusters or star cluster formation so much as talking about the effects of feedback on star cluster formation. So this is mostly going to be talk about feedback. Um, now, my first slide, I probably don't have to do anymore because of John Bally's wonderful talk from yesterday, is this is basically to convince you that we should be interested in feedback. Um, so if you remember from John's talk uh, yesterday afternoon, he showed lots of bubbles and lots of structure in the ISM formed by, uh, caused by feedback. This is an image of 30 Doradus. This is a multicolor image. So the red here essentially is showing um, the warm dust, okay? In green, we've got H alpha emissions. So this is the warm ionized gas. And then in the blue, we've got X-ray emission from the very hot sort of 10 to the 7 Kelvin ionized gas. And then in the white, um, we've got what's left over from in terms of the dense molecular gas, okay? Which presumably is the leftover from what formed this thing in the first place. And so the point of this is just to show you that Feedback matters, all right? It's changed the distribution of gas and dust here a lot. Okay, and so the other reason that feedback matters is that we probably get the wrong results without feedback. Um, so this was talked quite a bit about yesterday. Without feedback, star formation is too fast. So the gas depletion rate is observed to be something like one to three orders of magnitude uh, slower than the freefall time, going back to the work of Zuckerman and Evans in the 70s, and more recently, for example, Evans in 2009. And yet, without feedback, if we run computer simulations, such as this one from my work from a few years ago, we find that the star formation rate is basically the freefall time. Okay? Now, strong magnetic fields help. We can maybe slow that down by a factor of four or five. Um, but feedback is also a prime candidate, for example, for driving turbulence for slowing down the rate of star formation. Now, in uh, sort of related to the rate of star formation is the efficiency. So when we see star forming regions in the galaxy, they tend to be very dense. There's high densities of new stars that have been born there. But if we go to 10 to 100 mega years later, only a few percent of the stars remain in bound groups and clusters. All right. So um, if again, if we go back to simulations without feedback, typically we start with bound initial conditions to produce clusters. And unless we use super virial initial conditions, these clusters tend to stay bound unless we introduce feedback. So again, a potential solution here is dispersal of the gas by feedback. Um, and then finally, star formation without feedback produces too many low mass objects. So this is the IMF produced by this calculation, and you can see way too many brown dwarfs have formed here. So as I said, this is a talk about feedback, and I'm going to be talking about three main categories of feedback. The first is you can think of as momentum feedback. So this includes things such as protostellar jets and outflows and radiation pressure. And these add momentum directly to the gas, or, or essentially directly to the gas. And the key here is that the cooling in the jets and outflows is very efficient. So the cooling of this gas happens in less than the dynamical time scale of the cloud. So the thermal energy in these outflows is unimportant. It's just radiated away. It's the momentum that matters. And that's different from hot gas feedback. So in hot gas feedback, so winds from hot stars, um, high velocity shocks, uh, ionization regions, you get very hot gas. And the key about this is hot gas cools very inefficiently. Um, on, so on, on timescales much larger than dynamical timescale of the cloud. And so in this case, you have hot gas, which essentially is pushing out because it's over pressure, and it sweeps out molecular material in front of it. And it never cools because its cooling time is too slow, so it just expands adiabatically into the rest of the cloud. And it can do a lot of damage, potentially. Okay, and then the final form of feedback is thermal feedback, where we have stars or protostars which radiatively heat the gas around them, and that will then change the way that the gas fragments. So I'm going to go through these basically one at a time, starting off with momentum feedback. Um, 
from protostator outflows. And this is thought to be important in terms of cloud structure uh, whenever you have a large number of stars forming close together in space and time. Um, and one idea, uh, well, one measure you can make to, to think about whether this is going to be important or not is to take the outflow momentum, divide that by the cloud mass that you're talking about. That gives you a velocity. And then you can compare that to the velocity dispersion of your molecular gas. And if it's comparable to the velocity dispersion in your molecular gas before you had the feedback, then it's going to do something significant to your cloud. What does significant mean? Well, there are three basic options. Um, if you inject all the momentum quickly um, and it's uh, sufficient, you may actually unbind the cloud completely. Um, if you're injecting uh, momentum more gradually, you may be able to maintain the turbulence in the cloud and potentially slow down the star formation rate, for example. Um, and then, uh, because jets and outflows seem to be collimated, if the coupling is low, then it may just simply punch holes in the cloud and not really affect the global evolution of the cloud very much. Um, so switching to observations for a minute, this is uh, sort of the prototypical proto-cluster, if you like. This is NGC 1333 in Perseus. This is a Spitzer three cuddler image here. And the green here is essentially looking at shocked uh, molecular hydrogen gas, which is shocked because of the protostellar outflows in this region. And if you switch to um, uh, CO maps, then you see these outflows here, red shifted, blue shifted outflows in this region, which is less than a parsec across. And it looks relatively complicated. Um, more recently, though, so these are single dish measurements here. Um, if we again zoom up on this region using the Spitzer uh, 4.5 microns, this is the shocked molecular gas again. But we now use uh, interferometry to get a map of these CO outflows. This is done by Karma and Plunkett et al. Um, you can see the complexity in this region. So there are overlapping outflows all over the place. And it would be very surprising if this isn't doing something to the turbulence in that region. OK, so a little bit more on observations of outflows. What can we learn from them? Um, the combined outflow energy often seems to be enough to at least maintain turbulence locally. And there are two main ways that people try to measure this. One is to look at the total kinetic energy in the outflow and try and compare that with the total turbulent energy in the cloud. And if you do that in a number of regions, you find that um, in a number of clusters, uh, the ratio is quite high, maybe 30%. Um, for some, it's a little bit lower, maybe a few percent up to 20%. So we're not talking 100% or greater than 100% here. So this energy is insufficient to unbind the cloud unless perhaps it continues for a long time. Um, another way to measure this uh, effectiveness of the outflows is to try and compare the total outflow power. So that's the rate at which kinetic energy is injected to the cloud versus the rate at which turbulent energy is dissipated. This is more difficult to estimate, but again, from these sorts of studies, you find that typically the outflow, the, en the power coming from the outflows is similar to the dissipation rate that you expect from the supersonic turbulence. And therefore, the outflows are probably capable of driving Turbulent, uh, maintaining turbulence on small scales. If you go to large scales, though, outflows don't have the, enough power to sustain turbulence in very large reasons, so in GMCs. And in that case, you probably need something else, such as uh, supernova driving on large scales, as was talked about yesterday. Um, OK, so that's observations. What about simulations? What can they tell us? So going back to the work of Lee and Nakamura, um, just after the last protestors and planets, I guess, um, they showed that you can uh, keep molecular clouds close to virial equilibrium through outflow feedback in magnetized clouds. And they also showed that collimated flows are actually more efficient at turbulent driving than spherical flows. And the reason for that is if you have spherical flows, flows they'll quickly run into each other, shock, and you'll lose the kinetic energy. Um, Robbie Banerjee um, looked again at how efficient jets are at driving um, supersonic turbulent motions, and he propagated jets into a very smooth medium. And what he found, actually, was if you propagate a jet into a smooth medium, it's actually really, really bad at generating uh, supersonic turbulence. However, um, Cunningham et al. and Carol et al. found that if you propagate jets instead into an already turbulent medium, then you're much better able to couple that to the gas and continue to drive turbulence, even in the absence of magnetic fields. Um, although magnetic fields do help, they help to 
um, couple the outflow to the larger scale gas through alphane waves, which can couple uh, across the cloud over large distances. And so the sort of situation here is summarized by this plot from Wang et al. So this is the, the star formation rate here with various different uh, levels of physics. So this one here is showing the star formation rate with no turbulence, no magnetic fields, no outflows. If you turn on turbulence, then you decrease the star formation rate. If you then throw in magnetic fields, you decrease it again. And if you throw in outflows as well, then you can get a much lower star formation rate than you can get with either any of the above. Okay, and this is indeed the simulation of Wang et al. Um, so this is showing this turbulent uh, cloud that you start off with. Um, collapsing to form protostars, which are down here, and then as these protostars form, they start to drive these outflows into the cloud, and these outflows help to maintain the, these turbulent motions in rough burial equilibrium. Okay, so that's enough about protostellar outflows. The other um, form of momentum feedback is radiation pressure. Um, so this transfers energy and momentum directly from the stellar radiation fields to the surrounding gas. And for high energy photons, uh, greater than 13 EeV, these can interact directly with the gas. Lower energy photons can also impart momentum, um, but they tend to do it mediated by dust grains. Um, now, this depends on the luminosity of your object. So essentially, because of the very steep mass luminosity relationship of stars, this ensures that radiation pressure feedback is going to be dominated by your most massive stars. So it's going to be very important in massive star formation. Um, so again, Ralph, Rolf Kuiper's um, recent simulations of massive star formation were mentioned this morning. Um, here, it's very important that you have a disk-type geometry and you can direct the radiation pressure outside of a, out of, out of a cavity. Um, and then also, well, we're talking about massive clusters, and even on galactic scales, it's thought that radiation pressure might be able to drive galactic winds. Um, as I said, radiation pre pressure depends on massive stars, so radiation pressure is less important than outflows in clusters with less than about 10 to the 4 solar masses. And the reason for that is that um, basically all stars have outflows, and so low mass stars as well as high mass stars can contribute to outflow driving, whereas in terms of radiation pressure feedback, it's only the very massive stars that matter. And because these low mass clusters don't fully sample the IMF, then um, it's less important in these lower mass clusters. Um, we can try and estimate the effects now using observations of radiation pressure. This is um, some observations again from Lopez et al. at 30 Doradas. Um, so they try and look at the effective pressure due to the radiation pressure. Um, this is uh, pressure in the H2 hot gas, and this is the pressure in the hot gas caused by X-rays, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and at least in the center of the 30 Doradus region, they conclude that actually radiation pressure is very important here. Um, when is radiation pressure important? Well, in terms of the global cloud scale, um, if you take the rate at which you're injecting momentum into the gas times the freefall time of the cloud, the typical evolution time, if that's greater than the cloud mass times the sort of virial velocity, again, your feedback is going to be very significant. The radiation pressure itself depends on the luminosity, as I mentioned, just divided by the speed of light. And if you combine these conditions together, then you find that radiation pressure is important whenever you have your surface density lower than about one gram per cubic centimeter. Now, you may be thinking, what's this F-trap factor? Well, a lot of the uncertainty here comes in trying to estimate this F-trap factor. The idea is that instead of just a photon interacting once with the gas, all right, you can actually have a photon absorbed and then re-radiated and absorbed again and re-radiated it and absorbed again. And so it can actually impart more momentum than you would have from just a single interaction. Okay, and so that's this F-trap factor. And some people think that F-trap will scale roughly as the infrared um, optical depth of the sort of clouds or, or galactic winds that you're talking about, um, whereas others think that maybe F-trap is more like unity. And there's a lot of uncertainty with this at the moment, so this is some uh, numerical simulations done by Krumholtz and, and Thompson, done using the flux limited diffusion approximation. Um, more recently, so Shane Davis here has been doing some different, ca or similar calculations, but using a different radiation transfer approximation. This is a variable Eddington tensor. And they find some sort of differences here, so I think this is an area where we still need to be able to pin down, pin down the efficiency of this radiation feedback. 
So that's momentum feedback. We're going to switch to hot gas feedback now. Um, so winds from hot stars. So hot stars, surface temperature is greater than about 40,000 Kelvin. That means main sequence mass is greater than about 40 solar masses. They drive very, very strong and very high velocity winds. Um, even so, if you're only interested in the momentum flux, the, the momentum flux they put out is less than that that you get in the radiation field. And so if you just thought about that, you'd say that radiation pressure from these stars is more important than the hot winds. However, the terminal velocities in these hot winds can exceed 1,000 kilometers a second. That means you get lots of shocks, high velocity shocks, which can heat the gas to enormous temperatures, millions, tens of millions of Kelvin. OK, so this is X-ray emitting gas. And the cooling times for this is very long. So now you're in this hot gas regime where the gas expands adiabatically. It just can't radiatively cool. And so you can put all of that thermal energy in the gas, essentially, into momentum as this adiabatic region expands. And so in a spherically symmetric case, so going back to the original models of Castor et al., you can sweep up shells and material as this uh, flow um, pushes out through your um, molecular cloud. That's in the spherically symmetric uh, case. But in reality, of course, clouds are a lot more structured. And so the uncertainties here come in how much of this hot gas actually can leak out through holes in your cloud and therefore reduce the um, effectiveness of driving the momentum into this molecular gas. Um, another thing is whenever you have these hot winds, you'll also have ionization regions, so H2 regions. Um, so Ye and Matzner introduced this wind parameter here, which essentially looks at the um, effectiveness of wind pressure in terms compared to um, or wind momentum compared to the momentum in the H2 region. All right, and so this, if this is much greater than unity, um, then winds are going to be more important than the H2 region itself. What do we know from observations? Well, the Chandray X-ray Observatory was really great for these studies um, because for the first time it made detection of X-ray emission from H2 regions possible. And so uh, Townsley et al. Um, did a lot of papers um, on this, and then there's been more authors since. And these essentially rule out these large values of uh, omega being much greater than 1. Um, so that's the case where everything would be spherically symmetric. But they also tend to give values that are larger than you expect from a freely expanding wind. So as you may expect, the truth is somewhere in between here. Um, and essentially, which one dominates in terms of, um, say, hot stellar winds or radiation pressure seems to depend on where you look. So in 30 Doradus, much of 30 Doradus, it seems that maybe the X-ray emitting gas is dominant. Um, but in an M17, radiation pre pressure perhaps dominates. Um, there are other ways of measuring this as well. So another method is optical and infrared line ratios. And again, the current data favors relatively low values of this omega parameter. Um, how about numerical simulations and, and theory? So as I said, the classical models are sort of one-dimensional uh, models where you sweep up molecular gas into shells of material. Um, these have been improved recently in terms of better treatments of conduction and radiative cooling. Um, and then some of the analytical models have tried to parameterize this leakage. Um, but I think probably the, the the most significant progress is going to be made in this area through simulations again. And what I have here is a simulation from Rogers and Pittard this year. Um, so this is a temperature map here. What you have is a cold molecular gas cloud here, and at the middle is a very hot star. And so as I start the movie here, what you see is this is all this hot gas which breaks out of the cloud because the cloud is not uniformly structured. And you can see that then a lot of this pressure is released through these holes in the cloud. And so it doesn't push out the molecular gas in a spherically symmetric sense. If it was entirely enclosed, it would have destroyed or at least pushed out the cloud a long way by now. And at the end, you'll see some supernova go off. There's two supernova explosions. But the point here is a lot of this molecular gas actually survives the hot wind phase. It's eventually pretty much obliterated by the supernova explosions. Um, but the leakage here matters a lot. OK, so that's hot winds. Now we're on to photoionization. Um, so again, whenever you have massive stars, uh, greater than about 10 solar masses, they emit lots and lots of ionizing photons. They create H2 regions with typical temperatures of about 10 to the 4 Kelvin and sound speeds of about 10 kilometers a second. And again, this over 
pressured gas will then, in a spherically symmetric sense, will push out, it will expand adiabatically into your molecular cloud and sweep up shelves of molecular material. So what sort of effects may they have? Um, <clears throat> they potentially limit the growth of massive stars, they potentially can trigger new star formation, and they can potentially affect giant molecular clouds, perhaps drive in turbulence, perhaps disrupt them. Um, but again, the case in reality is not spherically symmetric, and so we have some simulations here done by Steffi Walsh uh, looking at how the fractal distribution of the clouds that you're driving these H2 regions into actually um, affects the way these clouds are destroyed, and I'll come back to that in a minute. In terms of observations, um, amazingly, we can now detect H2 regions um, formed by single O stars at distances of up, or in excess of 10 kiloparsecs or so. So we have many hundreds of H2 regions. And again, I'll just refer you back to John's talk from the point of view of lovely images of bubbles. But there are some other ones, nice ones here from this Green Bank H2 region discovery survey that was uh, recently published by Anderson et al. And of course, this huge sample of H2 bubbles now enables us to start looking at how these bubbles interact with, with dust, molecular gas, stellar winds, and so on. In terms of the theory, um, as I mentioned, H2 regions are perhaps a good way to limit the growth of OB stars because essentially you ionize all the nearby molecular gas, it then expands away from your star and so you can't accrete onto it anymore. However, there are various different ways to get over this. So Malcolm Walmsley a while ago suggested that if you actually still have large or oh, rapid accretion flows onto your massive star, you can actually crush the H2 region and uh, it will stall and actually reverse and you can still continue to have accretion. Um, then Eric Keto points out that um, even, if, even if you have um, ionized material around your star, if that's gravitationally trapped, in other words, if the escape velocity is greater than this 10 kilometers a second sound speed, then you can still get accretion onto the massive star. It's just ionized accretion. Um, Alternately, instead of having a spher spherically symmetric case, you can have accretion through a disk, for example, onto your star, and the ionization region can be in a sort of bipolar sense, so you can continue via disk accretion. Um, and then, very recently, Hosokawa um, pointed out that when you're accreting onto massive stars at these high rates, um, you can go through this period where these things puff up to around 100 times the radius of the sun. And when they do that, their photospheric temperature drops and they no longer contribute many, as many ionizing photons. Um, so again, this can help massive stars to keep accreting up to higher and higher masses. Um, and then finally, in some simulations, ionization is unable to disrupt accretion until actually you've got rid of most of the cold material um, by accretion onto other accretors. That's work done by Peter Zetel. Um, so that's sort of forming massive stars. On larger scales, in terms of molecular clouds, there have been a lot of simulations recently in terms of H2 expansion into turbulent clouds or fractal clouds. Um, I think it's still, the jury's still out on whether this could drive um, GMC scale turbulence or not, but certainly destruction, destruction particularly of low mass clouds, certainly seems possible. So both Steffi Walsh, who I mentioned before, and also Jim Dale, these are some of Jim Dale's simulations, find that just a few O stars are very effective at destroying sort of 10 to the 4 solar mass clouds. Um, but Jim finds that as the escape velocity of the cloud is sort of approaches this 10 kilometer per second value, then in fact, you don't tend to destroy your GMC. It tends to mostly survive, and you'll have regions where um, the ionization region and the gas punches out of the cloud, but much of the, gas, the, much of the cloud still survives. How about triggering? So um, essentially, all of the feedback I'm talking about is, po is negative in the sense that it stops stars from forming. Um, but you may also have some triggering, and Jim Dale um, makes a distinction between weak triggering, which is essentially um, temporarily increasing your star formation rate by inducing stars to form more quickly than they would otherwise form anyway. So this doesn't actually produce more stars, it just sort of speeds things up a bit. Um, and then you can have strong triggering, which is actually an increase in the overall star formation efficiency. And the question is, um, do either of these occur? Um, now, again, going back to the sort of spherically symmetric models, um, so going back to Whitworth, for example, um, when you have these H2 regions, if they expand into a uniform density cloud, they will push up shelves of material, and eventually, if you accumulate enough 
mass in your shell, that shell can become self-gravitating, collapse, and form new stars. And this may even produce a top-heavy IMF if that happens. So these are simulations, again, by Jim Dale, showing the mass function that they get out of these fragmenting shells, and it's very top-heavy. And that opens up the prospect of star formation as a self-propagating process, um, as first proposed by Shaw. And the idea here is essentially you have a massive star, sweeps up material, that then fragments, forms another massive star, forms an H2 region, expands, sweeps up more material, forms another massive star, etc. Okay. However, if we do sort of more realistic simulations, okay, in fractal or turbulent clouds, although um, there's a big you know, effect on the, the gas cloud, maybe you can destroy the cloud, maybe you can change the rate and efficiency in different ways. Um, so far, the IMF doesn't really seem to be changed, so it doesn't seem that you do get these um, populations of top-heavy IMFs from this way. Um, another way to trigger star formation, which was mentioned um, yesterday, um, is this radiation-driven implosion model. Um, so again, there's been more work done recently on this. The basic idea here is you start off with a um, say a Bonnery, but sphere, a cold molecular gas cloud, which is then overrun by an H2 region, and the increase in pressure essentially um, compresses this cloud until it's at the point where it will then collapse under its own gravity and form um, protostars. And so this is a way potentially of increasing the efficiency of star formation. This would be strong uh, triggering. Okay, and so recent work here has been looking at improving the physics that goes into the treatment. This is uh, Tom Harworth's work, and then Tom Bisbass here um, showing how these things collapse to actually form protostars. What about observations? Um, well, as mentioned again by John yesterday, evidence, trying to find from observations evidence, strong evidence for triggering is very, very difficult, okay? Um, the sort of things that are done, uh, people search for young stars near bubbles or near ionization fronts. This is some work done by uh, Snitter et al. Um, so in this region here, they're trying to find the ionization fronts and then they find the protostars. This will flick backwards and forwards if you watch it, that may be close to those ionization fronts and get an idea of the triggering that might have gone on in that region. Uh, you can also look for age gradients or associations with feedback sources. Um, and generally, you um, claim a causal link when the age difference is less than the crossing time of the region. Okay? The other thing you can look at is um, whether you're generating a higher star formation efficiency locally than you would otherwise expect. Um, so there's been some very nice large-scale surveys done uh, in the last couple of years looking at um, the correlations, just spatial correlations between bubbles and young stellar objects. And these seem to imply that triggering does happen, but maybe um, the effect on the overall star formation efficiency is at the sort of 10 or 20% level. So it's not completely negligible, but it may not be dominant either. And I think that's probably consistent with what we're seeing coming out of the simulations in the sense that Jim Dale finds that negative feedback tends to dominate on the larger GMC type scales. <coughs> okay, the last form of hot gas feedback <coughs> is supernova. Okay, so these occur at a rate of about one per hundred solar masses of stars formed. Um, and again, this is hot gas feedback because all of the energy goes into really hot gas, which then doesn't cool effectively. However, um, in terms of star cluster formation, these are probably not very important because they only occur roughly four million years or so after the star formation has started forming. <coughs> So, for example, if you look at the 30 Doradus region, there's only one detected supernova remnant that's been found, and the radius of its um, uh, bubble that it's evacuated so far is much smaller than um, this hot gas that I was showing you in the very first slide. Similarly, in Westerland 1, there's no supernova nova remnant yet detected, and yet both of these clusters have managed to eject lots of gas through other forms of feedback. So at least in terms of clusters, it's maybe not very important, but on GMC and galactic scales, as was mentioned again early yesterday, um, supernovas are one of the primary candidates for feedback, and that's because the dynamical time scales in these regions are much greater than the lifetimes of the massive stars. 
finally, <coughs> we get to uh, thermal feedback. OK, so thermal feedback is inevitable. As soon as you start forming a star, so you have gravitational collapse of a molecular cloud, then you're converting gravitational potential energy first into kinetic energy, then into thermal energy, and then that will be radiated away. All right, And that's that radiation then can go out and heat surrounding molecular gas and therefore change the way that it fragments. Um, so once you've got stars, you've got three main sources of thermal feedback. One is the luminosity from the star itself, and this was mentioned by Amy a little bit in the talk this morning. Um, so the luminosity of the star itself, then you've got accretion luminosity um, of material accreting onto the star, and of course that depends on the accretion rate and also on the radius, inversely on the radius of the star. And then you've also got luminosity from the rest of the collapsing cloud and from disk accretion. Now because of the inverse de um, dependence on uh, radius here, essentially the accretion onto the star will usually um, exceed the luminosity that's coming from the larger scales, but you've still got the question of whether the intrinsic luminosity of the star will dominate over the accretion luminosity or the other way around. And essentially it depends on mass here. So for low mass protostars, less than about three solar masses, for reasonable accretion rates, um, you actually find that the accretion luminosity is more important than the luminosity from the source itself, whereas for massive stars greater than about nine solar masses and any realistic accretion rate, then it's actually the intrinsic luminosity of the star that dominates and not the accretion luminosity. And in between, of course, it just depends on your accretion rate and your radius and all that sort of stuff. OK. Um, the details then also depend on um, how much energy is actually released in other forms than just radiation. And again, Amy mentioned this briefly this morning. Um, if you put a lot of your energy instead of into radiation, into actually driving outflows, then obviously that's going to um, reduce the amount of thermal feedback you have. It also depends on whether your accretion is steady or episodic, and it depends on the entropy of the material that you're accreting onto the star. Why does it depend on that? Well, if you're accreting high entropy material, material onto your star, your star tends to puff up in radius, and that means then that your accretion luminosity that you're getting out reduces, all right? And then similarly, um, if you're accreting in uh, bursts, you may go through long periods of time where your accretion luminosity is actually very low, and so there's not very much thermal feedback, the surrounding gas can fragment quite freely, and then just have very short bursts when you have high luminosities. What sort of level of feedback are we talking about? And again, this came up as a question this morning. I can't remember who it was, but hopefully this will help answer the question. So Mark Krumholz did some analytical estimates of the effect of this uh, thermal feedback um, from sort of solar mass type protostars, for example, accreting at high rates, and found sort of 100 Kelvin heating out to a few hundred AU, maybe 30 Kelvin heating out to thousands of AU. And this is confirmed by radiation hydrodynamical simulations. So this is one of my more recent calculations here. This is column density and temperature here. And you can see that as this cluster builds up with more objects and they start accreting at high rates, then you can get significant heating. This is about 20 to 30 Kelvin here on scales of a few tenths of a parsec. And the exciting thing now is we can actually see this, okay? So recent uh, new telescopes and new instruments on telescopes have allowed us to start measuring this thermal feedback for the first time. So again, going back to NGC 1333, this is SCUBA2 results by Jenny Hatchell. Um, this is a temperature map, this is a density map, and you can see here in this protocluster, um, there's a lot of heating by these young stars here. Um, using the JVL, JVLA. Um, again, there's evidence for protostellar heating in infrared dark clouds. And then this is a Herschel result up here in the Corona Australis region. So again, by looking at um, multiple wavelengths in Herschel, you can get rough temperature maps. And that's what's seen here. This bar here is 8,000 AU long. And so again, these protostars, each of these protostars is heating the gas on scales of a few thousand AU, exactly the way we see it in the simulations. So what effect does this have? Um, well, it has a huge effect on the IMF, and this was mentioned yesterday, so I'm just going to briefly mention it again now. Thermal feedback reduces the number of objects that you form in terms of fragmentation, particularly in hybridine disk fragmentation. It then, that correspondingly reduces the proportion of brown dwarfs, bringing them into much better agreement with observations. And it also seems to weaken the dependence of the IMF on your initial conditions in your cloud, which is great from the point of view of us trying to produce a universal IMF or a near universal IMF. Um, and so, for example, 
um, in my old 2009 calculation, which I showed at the start, we're producing more brown dwarfs here than we are stars. When you turn on the thermal feedback, you reduce the fragmentation, so the characteristic mass goes up, and voila, it lies right on top of Gilles Chabrier's IMF. And so we can reproduce the IMF um, using this thermal feedback. Um, that's at the low mass end of the IMF. At the high mass end of the IMF, things are very similar. And again, Chris McKee mentioned this a little bit this morning. Um, uh, so without thermal feedback, you've, if you've got very dense molecular cores, they will tend to fragment into many, many objects just because your genes mass is very low. However, if you include thermal feedback, then that can substantially um, reduce the fragmentation in these very dense regions, producing perhaps instead uh, just a few massive stars in this calculation, for example, by Krumholz et al. in 2007. And again, as Chris mentioned, the implication here is that massive stars may preferentially form in regions with very high densities. OK. Um, now, thermal feedback, though, can actually be a problem, okay? It can be actually too effective. So this calculation in 2011 by Krumholz et al., um, they found this overheating problem. So they formed a little cluster of stars, okay? And that started heating up the gas around it. And what they found was you got to a point where the thermal feedback was so strong that it just stopped any new stars from forming. And that meant then that all of the surrounding gas kept piling onto the few stars that you had formed initially. And so as time went on, your IMF got more and more top heavy. Okay, so this eventually would produce a very top heavy IMF. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, right, so that's, that's each feedback mechanism sort of individually. Okay, but in reality, of course, these things are all going on at once. And uh, for low mass stars, it's perhaps not quite so bad because the primary feedback mechanisms will be outflows and thermal feedback, may be a little bit of photoionization for disks and so on. All right, for high mass star formation, it's a lot more complicated because basically everything's involved. All right, and very few simulations to date have included multiple mechanisms. Um, but it is starting and it's going to get um, a lot more over the next few years. So Cunningham et al., for example, have already included thermal feedback, radiation pressure, and outflows for these massive star formation calculations. And they find that the outflow cavities are very, very important for allowing an escape route from the radiation and reducing the effects of radiation pressure on the core. Um, Hansen et al. have included thermal feedback and outflows for no low mass clustered star formation. And they find that essentially the effect of the outflows is to reduce the accretion rates onto these protostars. And if you reduce the accretion rates onto the protostars, you're also reducing the thermal feedback. All right, so, and then um, Mark Krumholz then took that one step further, again, looking at these larger clusters, and showed that if you combine the effects of outflows and turbulence, you can reduce this overheating problem. Um, and so the movie associated with that is the top one here. And down the bottom, what we've got is cumulative IMFs. Um, think of the, the gray thing as, as observations. And um, the line here that moves, this is the overheating case, okay, so where your cumulative IMF just continues to move to higher and higher masses, eventually giving you a top heavy IMF. Um, when you include the outflows and the turbulence, you reduce the effectiveness of the thermal feedback, and so you can get an IMF which is in much better agreement with observations um, for a lot longer. Finally, um, Thermal feedback and magnetic fields, how do they interact? Um, well, again, as I said, thermal feedback depends on the accretion rate. So anything you can do to modify your accretion rate is going to alter your thermal feedback. And magnetic fields are a good way, potentially, to increase accretion rates. Um, so magnetic fields are very good at transporting angular momentum, potentially increasing accretion rates. And that's been found in calculations um, both of individual cores and clusters by Commisson. Again, one of those was shown this morning. Um, and again, by Myers et al., showing that magnetized star formation um, produces higher accretion rates and therefore actually larger effect of thermal feedback than you get without the magnetic fields. On larger scales, uh, myself and also Myers et al. Um, uh, have shown that, um, well, thermal feedback essentially inhibits small-scale fragmentation, um, and magnetic fields can inhibit large-scale fragmentation. Um, and combining them together can actually greatly reduce the efficiency at which you convert gas into stars. So these are hydrodynamical case here without and with uh, radiative feedback. And then as you increase the magnetic field, then you can push your star formation rates down by maybe a factor of four or five. 
Okay, so that's about the end. What about the future? What do we expect for protest, pl protest stars and planet seven? Um, well, obviously, we're always needing to improve our understanding in nearby low mass environments. But I think the key here for trying to understand feedback in particular, and, and even just star formation in general, is now to try to push to more extreme environments. Um, and that necessarily means distant environments. And so ALMA is going to be key here in terms of studying protostellar clusters. Um, ALMA, because we need the long wavelengths to actually peer into these things and see what's going on, but also because of the high angular resolution, which we need for studying distant regions, which are more extreme, and also the sensitivity. On the theory side, um, no simulation currently includes all feedback mechanisms, so we need further code development to do that. But by protostars and planet seven, it's probable that there's going to be quite a few codes that include both magnetic effects and feedback effects and multiple feedback effects with much more accuracy than we get today. Um, I think two of the things we really have to concentrate on are progress in initial conditions. Um, so we heard a little bit about this yesterday, but the initial conditions are still somewhat um, crude, shall we say. Um, and then also, just because these calculations have been so time consuming, we haven't yet um, explored much of the parameter space. And so again, we really have to tackle that over the next few years. And I'll take some questions. Well, thanks for that great overview, Matthew. So questions, please. Please come to the microphones and uh, let's get started. Just line up on top and bottom here. And I think Chris McKee. Yes, uh, Matthew, I wanted to uh, add a question about the uh, possible role of supernovae. Um, as you mentioned, there are a number of different feedback effects that occur with massive stars, but the photoionization occurs first. And it's uh, my uh, impression that in many cases, uh, particularly if you're talking about the very massive stars that can explode after only 4 million years, the H2 region associated with those is so uh, uh, large that it essentially pushes away all the molecular gas and by the time the supernova goes off it's going off in a very low density cavity and ha would have almost no effect on the uh, cloud. So could you comment on that? Well, I think you're right. That's a potential problem and I, I think to be honest we just don't know at the moment. Um, so for example if you go back to these calculations of, of Jim Dale, I mean this one here in particular was a relatively low mass cloud, about 10 to the 4 solar masses, but he's also done other ones, maybe 10 to the 5 solar masses. And in particular, in the 10 to the 5 solar mass clouds, which of course are more likely to form a lot more massive stars, um, you get holes here, but much of the cloud material is actually pretty much left alone by the H2 regions. And so in that case, I think um, the supernova explosions are going to run into a lot of molecular gas which has been left behind. Um, but I think it, it probably depends very much on the mass of the star forming region. So in these low mass cases of maybe 10 to the 4 solar masses of gas, you may very well be right. Most of this molecular gas may already be gone. Yeah, but even if the molecular gas is, uh, you know, maybe only 10 parsecs away and is pressurized, nonetheless, the low density gas just means that the shock wave will, all the energy of the supernova will be deflected outward. Okay. Okay. Could you please give your name and wave at whatever microphone you're at? I see a person here. Yes. Peter Wojtke. Um, my question is about the sink particles, about the method that is used to compare to the IMF. So I think you, you show beautiful models and they match so beautifully with the data. That yep. makes me a little bit suspicious. I mean, say, isn't there a certain amount of human uh, interference <coughs> that I know what exactly is a sink particle? Where, where do I put it? I mean, my question is, is, is there actually some kind of hidden tricks in these simulations that are actually important? But, but, but many people use the same concept now, and it's, it's working very well. I just yep. want to know. Sure. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, the bottom line is sink particles are completely essential. Otherwise, we just can't do the calculations at all. So as was mentioned this morning, I think, um, you know, if you don't include sink particles, you can run the calculation for about one year, right? So, um, so they're a necessary evil. Um, but I mean, I, I essentially invented them and they're horrible, okay? Um, the, what I do in my simulations, I can't necessarily speak for, for Mark, for example, but what I do in my simulations is I try and make them as small as possible, all right? And so um, the calculation um, where we're getting sort of the right IMF now, wherever that's gone, um, 
is um, what we're doing now is sink particles there have accretion rate of only half an AU, all right? So we're modeling the fluid right down to half AU scales. And in particular, we don't create the sink particles until we've gone through this first hydrostatic core phase and we're actually into the um, dissociation phase. We're in the second collapse and we introduce the sink particle one week of real time before the star, the stellar core actually forms, okay? So I think at least in my calculations, you know, the aim there is to resolve the opacity limit of fragmentation, all of the brown dwarfs and stars, and we actually go right down to very, very small scales before we insert these things. Um, yes, there are uncertainties, but I think, I think they're not the major uncertainties at the moment. I think the physics is probably, um, other physics, radiative transfer, magnetic fields, and so on, is probably more important at this point. Okay, we'll go over here, then here, and then back to the center. Yes? So, uh, Diederik Krause, MPA. Uh, going back to the title of this review, uh, Stellar Cluster Formation and Feedback, I think yep. you've given a brilliant overview of just how the clustered nature of star formation affects feedback and what you can get from that. But I think it's also important to try and turn the problem around and say, how does feedback affect cluster formation? And it's almost a trivial point to make, but if you end up with a bound cluster, then clearly feedback cannot have been important, right? Um, so I think that's just a point I'd like to make. I also have a question, which is towards the end of the talk, you mentioned that we're getting to the point where all the physics might be able to be added into a single simulation. Uh, none exists so far. Do you think we're actually reaching the point where we understand the degeneracies and the combinations of all effects sufficiently to be able to make such a sort of divine simulation? Um, okay, so, so the first point was, um, sorry, stay at the microphone just to remind me. What, what was your first point? Oh, the, the thing about, well, as you noticed, I don't really have any conclusions, all right? So this is, this is basically a talk about where we are at the moment in the field, all right? And so, um, you know, how does feedback then affect um, the star cluster that you get out the end? I think we just don't know that at the moment, all right? So for example, um, you know, these calculations don't include anything except thermal feedback, right? So there's no, well, there's no massive stars in these either. But, but at some point, right, you're going to invoke massive stars to maybe turn off feedback. You're going to invoke it to um, expel the gas, giving you either a bound cluster or an unbound cluster. And I think we're not yet at the point to, to be able to say, you know, what ratio of this or that and so on. Um, so this is where we are at the moment. The question you had was? Do you think we understand oh, the combined effects well enough? Absolutely not. No, no. That's, as, as I said, at the moment, um, most of the simulations included maybe one or two types of feedback, um, but we don't really know how those interact with each other yet. We do, we do know that magnetic fields interact with thermal feedback. We know that you know, outflows interact with thermal feedback and so on, but we don't really have a comprehensive picture of, of that. And I think magnetic fields, all, all, all bets are off. So, so, I mean, as was mentioned yesterday, I think magnetic fields potentially lower the the characteristic mass of the IMF if they're very strong. I mean, how does that work, right? And how does it give you a, a universal IMF? I don't know, so. Okay. Uh, Mike Meyer, ETH Zurich. Yeah, you stayed. I, I did, I listened. He never comes to my talks. Um, <coughs> <laughs> well, by this question, you can assess whether I did this one or not. Um, I'm trying to connect what Mark left us with, which I took yesterday, which I took away as a kind of ambiguity between the global collapse scenario or the driven turbulence scenario, and then combine that with the modest but extant age spreads that, that Rob described. Um, you, you, you set up the problem of the star formation rate as too fast and too efficient, but I usually think of it as either or. And can you comment on, on which of the feedback mechanisms you reviewed, whether they push you to solving the too fast problem or solving the too efficient problem? Or, is, or are we just stuck somewhere in the middle on all fronts? Okay, so I think that the too fast problem is probably nicely illustrated by this plot from Wang et al. Okay, <clears throat> so this is with no feedback and no turbulence, you get enormous star formation rates. Uh, put in turbulence, you can decrease it. Put in magnetic fields as well, you can decrease it some more. Put in all three, you can decrease it a lot, okay? Um, so this sort of addresses the, the rate business, um, but um, none of these are actually going to stop star formation at all, eventually. So maybe you reduce, reduce the rate from, I don't know, 50% uh, 
50% per free fall time to maybe a few percent per free fall time. But if you keep going then for 100 free fall times or something, you're still going to get 100% efficiency, right? So, um, so I think these uh, potentially address um, the rate. In terms of the overall efficiency, then I think you probably have to appeal to things, at least in the more massive clusters, such as H2 regions, um, uh, radiation pressure and so on, some way to get rid of the gas in terms of giving you an overall efficiency. So combining the two is key then? Yeah, definitely. We need everything. Okay, last sharp pointed remark from Hans. Oh no. Hans Zinnecker from the Sophia Science Center. Uh, I wanted to come back to uh, where Chris McKee left it, I mean the supernova triggered star formation or supernova feedback and uh, wanted to, I mean, I think the jury is still out and it will be uh, important uh, uh, developments in the next few years, but I wanted to give two, two comments. And one is, there, there is some evidence in the galaxy, particularly in the upper Scorpius, that supernova triggering actually has occurred mm -hmm. and uh, because the low mass stars and the high mass stars or B stars around there, they seem to be coeval. There has been some doubt in the, by Eric Mamanchek, I guess, but I, I think Thomas Pribish and myself, we, we still maintain that, that the upper Scorpius is coeval and if it's coeval, it's got to be triggered because there's no, no time to inter... Sound waves don't propagate. But the other aspect I wanted to, to throw in and for the future is I think we have to think about starburst galaxies. I haven't heard the word starburst here yet, I mean, or, or, or galaxies. Um, and that is maybe a different mode. So I, I, I don't know whether anyone is going to address what's different in a starburst. Is it just more clustered H2 regions or are supernovae actually uh, having an effect there in, in terms of a, a positive triggering? And uh, the idea is that if you have a, a clump at the right distance, of course it's very close, mm -hmm. it gets shattered, but there must be a sweet spot for supernova triggering. And I wonder whether anybody is going to address this at this conference, and if not, at PP7. Yeah, I'm pretty sure nobody's going to address it at this conference. <coughs> okay. um, I think with that remark, we have to move on. Thank okay. you very much, Matthew.